it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. My homeowners association seems to be a little too passionate about enforcing its rules. Oh, it was the perfect house. Built in the craftsman style, it was a beautiful amalgamation of wood, stone and brick. Its solid walls were adorned with broad windows that welcomed the early morning sunlight. It had a pillared porch made of old and stained wood that stood overlooking a lawn so well maintained it resembled a green carpet. A gravel driveway led up to a garage that was set up next to the house. The rooms were spacious, waiting to be filled with dreams and memories. It seemed like the ideal place to raise a family in. If only we had better neighbours. We had our first encounter with the Homeowners Association on the very day we moved in. The sun beamed fire down upon us as we moved our boxes from the truck I'd rented into the house. My wife and daughter were inside, sorting through the boxes, deciding which ones to open first, while I was out on the driveway, taking a short break from the tiring work to admire the gigantic oak tree that stood in the corner of the property, with one of its thick branches sneaking up to a window upstairs. I didn't even notice when she snuck up on me. Oh, it's a beautiful house, isn't it? I jumped, startled. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I turned around and squinted, putting my hand up to my forehead to protect my eyes from the fiery sun. It was a woman, early to mid-forties, short blonde hair in a wavy bob cut. She was dressed professionally in a pencil skirt suit and had a leather binder in her hand. With a smile, she extended her hand. I shook it. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm the president of the Homeowners Association here. Hello, Amanda, I greeted her. I'm Irfan, Irfan Abbas. I guess we're your newest neighbors. Her smile grew broader. Seems to be that way. Although I'm not your immediate neighbor, I live three houses down the street. She chuckled. Glad to have you in our community, Irfan. Hope you and your family come to love this place as much as we do. I sure hope so, I replied. Never thought we'd make it to a gated community. Oh, it's... Absolutely perfect, she gushed. There's a great school just within walking distance. The HOA maintains its own childcare center, and we even have a common swimming pool and a tennis court just around the corner. I read about it when I signed the documents for the house, I admitted. It truly does sound like a dream. (laughs) Like I said, it's perfect, she giggled. I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, I flashed her a warm smile. But probably the best thing about living here are the people, she added. We truly have a sense of community here, you know. We all look out for each other. If anyone needs anything, the rest of us are always willing to help. I hesitated. Yeah? She frowned. Oh, is everything okay? Yeah, no, no, I said hastily. Everything's fine. I didn't want to tell her about our next-door neighbor. Who didn't really seem at all happy to see us. He sat in his cane chair, next to the big flag proudly fluttering from a pole mounted on the deck, with a permanent scowl on his face as we moved our luggage into the house. Oh, you don't mean David, do you? She flushed, slightly embarrassed. Please don't mind him. David's harmless. He's just been a little down ever since he lost his son. He died there, you know, in Afghanistan. She leaned forward and added that last part in a whisper. We're from Iraq, I clarified. Right, right, she replied dismissively. As I was saying, he's a lovely person. Just give him a chance. I'm sure he'll come round. I nodded. Sure. So, um, if there's anything else? Well, I really do have a lot of work to get done today. Oh yeah, um, before you go. I looked at her as she fumbled with the clasp of her binder before pulling out a crisp white paper. Here. She handed it to me. This document contains all the rules that the members of the HOA are supposed to follow. Standard stuff about lawn maintenance, house upkeep, and trash collection. My eyes scanned the document. Sure. 
Please read it carefully. I will. No. Please. Do read it carefully. I looked at her in confusion. Like I said, I will. Well, her hand shot up like a viper and she grabbed my wrist. I winced at the vice-like grip she had on me. The smile was gone from her face, replaced by a disturbing mix of fear and frustrated impatience. I must repeat myself again, Mr. Abbas. It's imperative that you read the rules very carefully. She was breathing heavily and had a manic look on her face. There were other residents who refused to follow the rules, or were just too lazy to keep up. Some of them had to eventually sell their houses and move on, and they were the lucky ones. I freed my hand and clenched my fist repeatedly. Um, are you threatening me right now, Miss Amanda? Her eyes widened. What? No, please try and understand. Everyone in this community has to follow the rules. Me, you, no exceptions. Bad things start to happen to us if we don't. Things that are entirely out of our control. She tilted her head and suddenly pointed at David's house. Was she trying to suggest... No, can't be. I'll say it once again. Please take this seriously. There's absolutely nothing strange about the rules themselves, but the consequences of not following them can be painfully out of the norm. Because, like I said, this place is perfect. But that sort of perfection always comes with a cost. Well, I was getting very weirded out by this conversation so just nodded as seriously as I could. We will take this with all the seriousness that it deserves, I promise. A smile crossed her face again. It was jarring just how quickly she switched expressions. Well, welcome to Seastone Ridge, Irfan. I decided not to tell my wife about the strange talk I'd had with the president of the HOA, at least not while our daughter was around. We could talk about nutty Amanda's strange behavior and superstitions later in the evening when Abida had gone to bed, I reasoned. As I strolled into the house, I saw my wife and daughter sitting on the floor and laughing as they chatted away. Oh, I could feel tears welling up in my eyes as I saw how happy and relaxed they looked. We'd seen so much, been through so much, and to finally be safe and comfortable like this was more than what we could have ever dreamed about. All worries and doubts faded from my mind. I was just relieved we were all together. Baba! Abida exclaimed when she saw me, her hijab almost slipping off her head. I smiled, placed the document Amanda had given me on an unopened box, and went and joined my family. We spent the whole day trying to make the house livable. We tackled the bedrooms first, and after Abida chose the room upstairs near the oak tree, I assembled her bed and then moved on to our room down the hall. By the time the sun began to go down, we'd set up the two bedrooms and gone through most of the work in the kitchen area. We ordered pizza for dinner, and after we ate it, we played a game of Uno before retiring to our bedrooms. There was a lot to be done the next day. Not just the packing, but I had to get in touch with my boss, and we had to look at high schools for Abida. I was so preoccupied with everything that my encounter with the HOA president in the morning completely slipped my mind, and I didn't tell my wife about it. Oh, I would come to regret that. A lot. I was having a fitful sleep, teetering at the edge of wakefulness, when a terrible screech ripped through the silence of the night. I sat up straight, my heart racing as another screech erupted and then another, followed by faint sobbing. I took a deep breath to calm myself down. My wife moved. I put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry, I got this. It's my turn. She grunted and mushed her head against the pillow. I yawned and rolled out of the bed, put on my slippers and walked out of the room towards Abidus. I flipped on the light switch and saw my daughter sitting up on bed, her knees drawn close to her chest, shivering and whimpering with a blanket wrapped around her like a cocoon. Hey, I said gently as I glided over and sat at the foot of her bed. It's okay, you're safe. She sobbed harder, tears streaming down her cheeks. It's okay, Abida, I repeated. You're safe. Nothing's going to harm you, okay? Her body got racked with shivers again. 
Abida, I said. I need you to breathe. Can you do that for me? She nodded. Breathe in. She inhaled. Now hold. One, two, three, four. Now breathe out. We went through her usual exercises. I asked her to breathe deeply, had her dig her toes into the bed, then asked her to think about the time we'd gone out to eat ice cream in Baghdad, back when her brother was still with us. She began to calm down. I wondered what had triggered the attack this time. Maybe it's the stress of moving into a new home. Well, I didn't have to wonder for long, because she told me soon after I hugged her. And it made my blood run cold. There was someone at the window, Baba. I froze. I swear, I'm not lying, she cried. There really was someone there. I jumped out of the bed and raced to the window. There was nothing out there, only the leaves of the oak tree gently scraping against the glass. I spotted the branch of the tree. It was thick enough to support the weight of a person. I couldn't see what he looked like. He just looked like a shadow, but I knew he was there. He was tapping against the window, and didn't stop until I screamed. Fear crashed into me like a hurricane. Could she be telling the truth? I mean, why would she lie? She has no reason to, and she's never lied about something like this before. My mind leapt back to the conversation I'd had in the morning with Amanda. Could this have something to do with what she was telling me about? No, <laughs> that's not possible. Baba, you believe me, right? Yes, Abida, I believe you. Of course I do. She gulped, put her trembling hand up and pointed at the door behind me. Because I think there was someone downstairs as well. I looked at her in stunned silence, half expecting a hand to slither out of the darkness and wrap itself around my neck like a boa constrictor. Beads of sweat trickled down my brow. I heard footsteps, but I wasn't really sure. But then I saw that shadow at the window. Go to your mother, I said fiercely. Lock the door behind you and call 911. I waited until she'd hurried over to her mother, watched as the door shut behind her with a soft click, and then prepared to move downstairs. My thumb hit the switch on the wall to my right, and the staircase was instantly bathed in a dull orange glow. But beyond that, there was utter darkness. From where I was, it looked like a living thing, shifting and swirling, ready to swallow anything that touched its infernal blackness. I took a step down and flinched as the floorboards creaked. I swore under my breath and hoped that the intruder hadn't heard me. I blinked as sweat trickled down my jaw and wondered whether I was doing the right thing. Should I go downstairs and check? What if I get attacked? I shook my head. Well, isn't it my job to protect my family? I bolted down the stairs, ignoring the painful creaks and groans, and rushed over to where I thought the light switch was, fumbled around for a couple of extremely tense seconds before feeling relieved when my fingers found it. My index finger, slick with sweat, pushed the switch down. The living room was blasted with light. I scanned my surroundings. The doors were locked. I was alone. Ah, oh, my daughter seemed to have imagined it all. Or at least, that's what I thought until my eyes dropped and I noticed the floor. In the middle of the living room, on the floor, someone had used mud to scrawl the word, Welcome. The writing was sprawling, occupying the space of a small coffee table. There were muddy boot prints that went back and forth from the word, probably made by the person who made this little sign. I tracked them, and my heart sank when I saw where they led to. I thought they'd lead to the front or the back door. But no. They led me to the locked door of the basement. Part 2 Well, I'm telling you, Mr. Abbas, there's no one here. I didn't reply, 
just silently watched as the flashlight dipped and wove across the walls of the basement. The small room was cramped, the clutter of the previous owners stacked in it from floor to ceiling. A faint smell of mould clung to everything like glue, but there was no trace of any intruder there. You saw the bootprints, officer, I pointed out. The cop, a Joseph Gorodzki, pulled his hat off and scratched his bald head. Are you absolutely sure that your daughter wasn't the one who drew it at all? I gritted my teeth in frustration. Once again, my daughter is not well, but you can be damn sure she's not crazy. He put his hands up to pacify me. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, but you have to understand. All signs point to it having been done by someone on the inside. Now we've searched the house, top to bottom. Found all the doors to be locked, and you've yourself confirmed that... That's the way they were before we arrived. I mean, you opened the basement door in front of us, right? I nodded sullenly. Right. He made a show of peeking behind a dust-riddled table. So then it means that this was done by someone on the inside. And as you say, you have a daughter with a history of PTSD, panic attacks, and a whole assortment of mental illnesses. I cut him off. It wasn't... Please... Mr. Abbas, he said, a little firmly this time as he stopped and looked at me. You should be aware that there are consequences to filing false complaints. Please make sure not to call 911 unless there's an actual emergency. Well, I wanted to argue with him, but what could I say? None of this made any sense. How could anyone have gotten in when all the doors and windows big enough for someone to squeeze through were all locked shut? And I definitely knew that it wasn't Abid. If she had done this, consciously or not, I would have known. I still remember how badly the stairs creaked and how loud they sounded in the silence of the night. Look, uh, perhaps you need a therapist more than the police. I didn't respond to that comment and just followed him back upstairs, shooting one last glance at the dark and foreboding-looking basement. A tall cabinet stood in the corner, an ideal place for someone to hide in. Well, if only its doors hadn't been ripped off. I shook my head and stomped upstairs, reminding myself to replace the incandescent bulb hanging by a string from the ceiling so that I wouldn't have to stumble around in the dark the next time I'm there. Back in the living room, I found Officer Gorochki's partner, Officer Schmidt, talking to my wife, who was seated on the only sofa we'd unpacked, protectively hugging our daughter. Are we done here? Joseph Gorochki asked. Yep, his partner replied, flipping his pad shut. Please, Mrs. Abbas, if there's any actual emergency, don't hesitate to call us. She smiled at him, and then shot me an angry look. What was that about? I followed the two cops outside and waited as they got into their car and drove off, lighting up the dark street in quiet flashes of red and blue. The neighborhood looked so calm, so peaceful. I could hear crickets chattering away, oblivious to the danger my family had just been in. Hard to believe that an intruder had come to our house, in a place that looked so deceptively safe. As I walked back in, I noticed Abida wasn't there. She was probably back upstairs. But not my wife. No, she was still sitting exactly where I'd left her, and just lit into me the moment I came in. So, she remarked, anger dripping like molten wax from her voice. When were you going to tell me? Tell you what? I asked, confused. This! She yelled, picking up a sheet of paper and waving it around angrily. I winced and squeezed my eyes shut. It was the document that Amanda had left for me, one that I'd forgotten to tell Rabia about. Well, how could you, Irfan? How could you hide something this important from me? Oh, it just slipped my mind. Slipped your mind? She thundered. Something that affects your family's safety just slipped your mind? Wait, how do you know about this? I asked. That list of rules didn't contain anything strange. It was just your average HOA staff. So how does she know about the implications of those rules? The ones Amanda had warned me about. That police officer was nice enough to warn me. She replied. Yeah, he told me everything. 
He has been patrolling this community for a while now, and knows everything that there is to know about this place. Everything that my husband should have told me. I learned from a stranger. It's just nonsense, I mumbled. Excuse me? I rubbed my eyebrows. You actually believe in all this, do you? That just because we didn't follow some random rules, we're suddenly being stalked by something supernatural. It's ridiculous. She looked at me like I'd grown another head. Yahrabia, you saw what happened tonight, didn't you? Someone was in our house. They broke in through the doors that were still locked after they left. I sighed. Funny how you take Allah's name and then state your belief in superstitious nonsense in the same sentence. While she glared daggers at me, I tried to de-escalate. But there's a reasonable explanation for all this, Rabia, I promise. There's no such thing as ghosts or jinns. You know that. Her bottom lip quivered. I I'm scared, Yifan. I'm so scared. I, I can't lose her too. I just can't. I won't survive it. I sat down next to her and took her in my arms. Nothing's going to happen to her, okay? I promise I won't let it. She sobbed into my chest as I rubbed her back. We went back to our bedrooms to lie in our beds and waste the night away trying to catch some sleep that would always be just out of reach. Before going up, I looked at the welcome scribbled on the living room floor and promised myself to scrub it out in the morning. I spent the night in Abida's room as she went and slept next to my wife. Lying in her bed, I turned on my phone's flashlight and read the rules over and over again. Rules for residents of Seastone Ridge. 1. Grass in the lawns must always be cut shorter than 5 inches. 2. Trash collection is on Monday morning. Garbage bins can only be placed outside after sundown on Sunday evenings, but must be taken back in by 7am on Tuesday. 3. Garage doors cannot be kept open for more than 15 minutes if no work is going on inside. 4. Reasonable noise limits cannot be breached between 9pm and 7am. Mowing the lawn is not allowed in this time period. 5. Any structural modifications to the house require the approval of the HOA. 6. Only shades of colours approved by the HOA can be used to paint the houses. I racked my brain and tried to remember if we'd inadvertently broken one of the rules, but I just couldn't come up with anything. Noise? <laughs> Abida screamed, but that only happened after the intruders came. Garage door? We were moving in? Ergo, working. Maybe the grass. Well, sure, it could be shorter, but it's not like I'd measured it with a ruler. I then snorted at the fact that I was even entertaining such ridiculous notions. Switched off my phone and closed my eyes. Sleep never came to me, as it had been chased away by fear and the resultant adrenaline. Anger was also bubbling in my stomach. How dare they try and traumatize my daughter? Exhausted and sleep-deprived, I shuffled downstairs when the darkness began to dissipate and the sun started climbing the horizon. Well, I'd pretty much scrubbed the living room floor clean when Rabia joined me after finishing up her morning prayers. She was cold with me, which was understandable, but at least she didn't seem as angry as she was the previous night. As she made breakfast, I started unpacking our stuff. The living room was pretty much done by the time Abida came downstairs for breakfast. We ate in silence, well, mostly. I'm sorry, Baba, Abeda whispered. It's my fault. It isn't, I replied. It isn't, okay? I believe you. We believe you. We're going to find out whoever did this and turn them over to the police, okay? Tears ran down her cheeks as I squeezed her hand. Rabia looked at me approvingly. After breakfast, I had a short conversation with Rabia, and decided to go out and talk to our neighbours about what had happened last night, to check what it was all about and whether it really was an isolated incident or part of an often repeated pattern. I didn't find Amanda as she'd gone to work, even on a Sunday, but I did meet many other people. 
And surprisingly, maybe perhaps not so surprisingly, the conversation always went the same way. They greet me with a smile on their faces, engage in some awkward small talk and get really uncomfortable when asked about the rules and possible intruders. Oh, you should follow the rules. Always follow the rules, they said. None of them claimed to have seen the police last night. Well, the uh, more people I talked with, the more suspicious I became. They were clearly hiding something, and I was damn sure it had very little to do with anything unnatural, because well, it's just impossible. Perhaps the most interesting and illuminating conversation I had was with my next-door neighbour, David Easton. It was the one I was least looking forward to, considering he'd been the most hostile to our presence. There was no wind, and his flag drooped on the pole in a morose manner as I went up to his door, which he opened before I could even knock. The wrinkles on his face churned as he grimaced at me. Hi, I said. I'm... He interrupted me. I know who you are. Oh, um, well, I, I was wondering if you... You don't belong here. I blinked. Excuse me, what? You don't belong here, he repeated. Veins writhed like worms under his skin as his eyes flitted around. If I were you, I'd leave. I'd pack my bags and take my family and drive until Seastone Ridge was nothing but an insignificant speck on my rearview mirror. Thanks, but no. Listen, friend, he said caustically. There are things you don't understand about this place. Things you couldn't even dream about in your worst nightmare. Leave, or you'll regret it. And then he slammed the door shut in my face. I was in a daze as I lumbered back to my house. There were a thousand different questions zooming around in my brain, a thousand different possibilities that bloomed in a dizzying mosaic. What was happening here? Was there actually something supernatural tormenting the residents of this community? Or were they all in on it, trying to drive us out of here? But, well, why? Nothing made sense. Each alternative seemed more outlandish than the previous one. I told Rabia about my meetings with our neighbours. She looked very frightened, and even suggested just moving out of this place. I reminded her of what it had cost to get here, and how we'd be in a very precarious financial position if we just upped and left. Uh, she wasn't convinced, but she did go silent after that. After lunch, I went around making sure that we were religiously following the rules of the HOA, just to be extra sure. I even measured the length of the grass with one of Rabbit's rulers, checked the lock on the garage door, made sure that the garbage bin wasn't visible from the outside, and then went back in to continue unpacking. Just to be sure, I even made a phone call and got the locks changed. Well, things escalated that night anyway. We continued the sleeping arrangements of the previous night, and so after dinner I took the trash bin out and retired to Abita's room. I was so exhausted that my very bones were aching, crying out for some sleep. Even the thought of someone climbing the oak tree and staring at me through the window wasn't enough to keep me alert. I fought hard against the inevitable wave of drowsiness that washed over me. I wanted to be awake in case we got a repeat of last night, and... We did. My eyelids were drooping. I was on the verge of sleeping when I heard it. Footsteps. Inside the house. On the staircase. They were slow, but drawn out and deliberate. Like the intruder wanted the attention. Each step led to a creak that was abnormally stretched out. Stomp. 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 God damn. Those floorboards made my heart flutter each time they groaned and shifted under the weight of the intruder. He must have been halfway up the stairs when I jumped out of bed and darted outside the room. I double-checked and made sure that Rabia and Abida were safely locked inside our bedroom before approaching the staircase. Boom. 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 
Boom. Shivers ran down my spine as the man rushed down the stairs before coming to an abrupt stop. He was at the landing downstairs, and I knew he was watching me, even if I couldn't see him, shrouded as he was by the darkness. I felt horribly exposed under the soft light that spilled out of the bathroom behind me. With trembling hands, I flipped the lights of the stairs on, and my heart pretty much exploded when I saw who, no, what, was standing there. It was a man, I... I think, just all in black, with long, matted locks of dark hair that seemed to frame what looked like the skull of a goat, stripped down to its bones, with sharp horns that protruded from it and curled half a foot above him menacingly. The eyes of this goat-faced man were large and glowed under the light. My knees wobbled in fear, and I almost collapsed. And then he bleated. It was shrill, loud, exactly like a goat. My heart raced so fast in my chest, I was afraid I was going to die there and then. There I was, at midnight, in my own home, my sanctuary. And there was a terrifying goat-faced man bleating at me. I was in mortal danger. My family, too. I'd never been this frightened, not even back in Iraq. Just then, when I thought things couldn't get worse... They did. Boom, 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 boom. An explosively loud sound thundered from the outside and continued, in rhythm. It was like someone was beating an infernal drum. It was a momentary distraction. The sound made me turn to my left, to look at the window that opened up to the lawn outside. When I looked back, the intruder, well, that thing was gone, but the sound didn't stop. I bolted towards the window in Abida's room and peered outside. And there he was, the same goat-faced man, beating on our garbage bin with a hockey stick. Just a couple of seconds ago he'd been right in front of me, in the house, and now suddenly he was outside. Or rather, he'd been outside, beating on the bin the whole time he'd been staring me down inside. I hesitated, the fear stopping me from moving, but not for long. I hurried out of the bedroom, taking a second to knock on our room to ask Rabia to call 911 before flying downstairs, skidding across the living room floor and flinging the door open. He was still there, standing next to the bin that he'd emptied out long ago. Trash littered our lawn. He glared at me and began bleating again, the obnoxious sound echoing in the street outside. I don't know what came over me, but I ran towards him. Fear and adrenaline were making me act irrationally, but I didn't get very far. I must only have taken a couple of strides when someone turned on the sprinklers. My vision blurred as the warm water crashed into me, and when I shielded my eyes to see clearly, I noticed that he was gone vanished into thin air again. Well, by this time, Rabia had turned on all the lights in the house, including the ones on the porch. She ran outside and screamed when she saw me. I looked at her in confusion, before my eyes dropped to my hands. They were dark red, just like my clothes. And that's when I understood. What the sprinklers had been spraying wasn't water. It was blood. Part 3 Well, this time the cops had no choice but to file our complaint. I watched them do it too, and made it a point not to change out of my blood-stained clothes until they'd done so. Officer Godotchki apologised for not taking us seriously the last night, and promised to get to the bottom of it all. He assured us that a patrol car would swing by at night and that they'd come down immediately if things went wrong. His partner, on the other hand, tried to pull me aside to warn me about those rules once again. I exploded. You will do your job now, Officer Schmidt. Thank you very much. Find out whoever is doing this instead of trying to scare me and my wife with your bullshit campfire stories, okay? Well, he looked flabbergasted. I'm just trying to help. 
I put my hand up to stop him and noticed it was still trembling. Don't, or I'll file a complaint of harassment against you. We're scared enough as it is. We don't need you to pile on top of all that with your nonsense. Well, he tried to say something, but Godotchki stopped him, flashing him a look of annoyance. Hey, leave it. We're done here. The two cops turned on the sprinklers and collected a bottle of the blood that was now saturating the lawn and drove off after the paperwork was done. I stripped off outside, wrung my wet clothes as much as I reasonably could before going back inside. Rabia refused to so much as even look at me. I figured I'd talk to her after I'd cleaned up, and so hopped into the shower upstairs. When I came back out, I found Rabia in the room, hurriedly tossing Abida's clothes into a small suitcase. What are you doing? I asked. Leaving. Leaving? Yes, she muttered. You honestly don't think I'll keep my daughter in this place anymore, do you? We talked about this yesterday. No, she snapped. You talked, I listened, and I'm done listening. We're leaving now. Slow down a second, Rabia, I said, trying to get in her way. Let's talk about this. It was in our house, Irifan, she yelled, her voice cracking as she shoved me aside. It was in our house, again, two nights in a row, and you still don't know how that thing got in. It's madness to stay here, just madness. Things are under control, I said. The cops are involved. We're going to put an end to it, okay? Put an end to what? She asked, her eyes widening in his aspiration. A goat-faced man sneaking in through locked doors, sprinklers gushing blood. You think the cops can help with that? They can't. It's... it's the work of the shaitan. I sighed. Oh. For fuck's sake. Don't cuss at me, she spat. You know I'm right. You saw it with your own eyes. How can you still stand there and say that whatever is going on can all be explained with logic? Damn it, Rabia. Just because we don't know how this asshole is sneaking in doesn't mean it's the devil, I replied, not quite believing myself. The incident had shaken me to the core, allowing doubt and fear to slip in through the cracks. There are no such thing as ghosts and the devil. It's humans, and I'm going to catch them, I swear. And you'll do it alone, she stated firmly. I won't spend another second in this cursed house. And where exactly will you go? A motel or, or whatever. Any place that's not here. So you'll run away? If that's what it takes to protect my child, then yes, I'll run like the wind. She answered. How long are you going to keep running, Rabia? I asked, my jaw clenched. We've been running our whole life. Half of Abida's childhood was spent in cramped bunkers and in the back of trucks. She can't keep living a refugee's life. We have to settle down. For how long are you going to force her to live without roots? As long as it takes, she shot back, because at least she'll be alive this way. I don't... She cut me off. I won't let you do it. I won't let you get her killed too. She screamed that last part. She was practically frothing at the mouth when she said it. She gasped, instantly regretting what she'd said, but it was too late. The damage was done. Her words had cut deep, like a butcher's knife carving pieces out of my soul. I looked at her, blinking to stop tears from pouring out. Do you think... Do you think it's my fault our son is dead? Oh, I didn't mean that, she said hastily. I didn't. It was getting hard to breathe. It felt like the walls were going to close in around me and swap me like a mosquito. I waved her off and marched out of the room, tears blurring my vision. Wheezing and with silent sobs racking my chest, I stumbled down the stairs and exited the house before collapsing on the doorstep and weeping like a newborn. I cried as the grief crashed into me all over again. I cried for my boy. I cried at the helplessness I felt at not being able to protect my family. I cried until my wife came and sat down beside me before hugging me. She held me and rubbed my back as I blubbered some nonsense about wanting her to trust me. 
She then led me back upstairs and made sure I went off to sleep. I wasn't even aware of any of it. I had a decent enough sleep that night. Fear, despair and anger fought a losing battle against exhaustion and I was able to get a bit of rest. It was almost ten o'clock when I woke up. I ran downstairs. They were still there. Abida was helping her mother unpack. My heart fluttered as an intense wave of gratitude and love washed over me, making me shiver. I called in sick that day and promised to join work when I felt better. My boss was understanding and told me to work from home until I was well again. We went to Abida's high school after I finished getting dressed, or what we hoped would become her high school. She had very bright chances of getting in, and it was the first bit of good news we'd received after a horrendous couple of days. Seeing the excited smile on my daughter's face as she took in the sights of the campus made me forget all the messed up stuff I'd seen the night before. In the afternoon, I got a call from Officer Gardokshki, who told me that the blood results had come back. It wasn't human blood. No, it belonged to an animal. A pig. Whoever had put that in our plumbing system knew what they were doing. They knew who we were, what our beliefs were, and wanted to intimidate us, keeping that in mind. When I told this to Rabia, she freaked out and insisted on making sure that we were still following the HOA's rules. She obsessively read that nonsensical document over and over again. I spent the day with her ensuring that everything was in order. We cross-checked the colour our house was painted with the approved list of colours, made sure that the garbage cans were not where they shouldn't be, they never were, checked the lock on the garage, and I even mowed the lawn when we didn't need to. At all. I tried to explain to Rabia that we'd followed the rules to a T, and that whatever was happening here clearly had nothing to do with any of that. It just made her madder, and even more obsessive about the rules. She went out and visited our neighbours herself and came back defeated after learning nothing new. Nothing other than follow the rules. If I'm being honest with myself, I think somewhere deep within me I was lying to myself that by following the rules I wasn't being safe or just doing it for Rabia's sake, but I was starting to believe that our nightly tormentor might actually be a monster. It was very important for me to disprove that once and for all. And so I replaced the light bulb in the basement in preparation for the coming night. I was going to get some answers, one way or another. We stayed in the rest of the day, finished setting up the house, had an early dinner, and went to bed after watching some Netflix. I sat on a chair next to the bed in Abida's room, waiting for our nightly dalliance with the intruders to begin. I'd vowed to myself that, if nothing else... I was going to find out how the fuck he got into the house despite the locked doors. And I did. And what I found froze my heart. It didn't take long for the nightmare to begin. It wasn't even close to midnight when the intruder announced its presence. The sound was short, sharp and rhythmic. Like something metallic being repeatedly smashed against glass. I sat up straight. The source of that sound was somewhere to my left. I turned my neck just a little and I saw it. He was there pressed up against the window, tapping with his gloved hand against the glass. As he saw me looking at his goat-like face, he sped up the tapping until he was knocking on the window in a manic frenzy. My entire body shivered with fear. Move, 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 I screamed at myself. But fear had taken complete control over my senses, and this terror only deepened when he started bleating. The sound made my blood run cold. It was so unnatural. How could any human being make that noise? Was my wife right? Had I really been messing with something supernatural? He punched the window in and tossed something inside, and smoke began flooding the room with a sharp hiss. Violent coughs exploded from my chest as the smoke stung my eyes and made them water. It billowed out from that one point, rising until it brushed against the ceiling. So I dropped down and began crawling towards its source. Oh, 
Oh, my throat was so parched that each cough scraped against it and threatened to rip the skin off. Yet water gushed out of my eyes. I ignored my discomfort and crept crawling forward until my hand wrapped around the thing. It was small, cylindrical, and so hot it seared my skin off. I winced, but fought through the pain and tossed that smoke grenade right out. The entire room had been filled with thick plumes of smoke, but the fire alarm never went off. I got up, leaning against the wall to support myself as my chest kept getting racked with lung rattling coughs. Reaching the shattered window, I leaned out and saw him. He was on the lawn, standing still and staring at me. I cursed under my breath, turned around and began running down the stairs. The smoke bomb had shocked me, but there was still time. I could catch him, find out who he was. I bounded down the stairs, fumbled the keys and threw the door open and stumbled outside. Fuck, he was gone. I went around the outside of the house, ducked under a branch of the tree, and groped around until I found the shell of the smoke grenade, tucked under a slightly overgrown root. As I was inspecting it, I felt light on my face. I looked up. He was there, in the room I'd just been in, framed in smoke and light that he'd just switched on to grab my attention. I froze, not quite believing my eyes. Oh, there's two men, I told myself. Of course that was it. What the fuck else could it be? There's no way he'd moved from out here on the lawn to inside the bedroom just like that, right? That mask was so damn terrifying. Thick black locks contrasting against the shining white of the goat skull. Those curving horns that oozed malice. I shuddered. He moved disappearing into the smoke and snapping me out of my fear-induced stupor. I ran back to the front door of the house, leaping through the open door. I was there just in time. Just in time to hear the basement door being slammed shut. I dashed towards the door, frantically turning the knob, only to find the damn thing locked. What the fuck was happening here? I didn't know, but I knew that I'd find the answer down there. Before going down into the basement, I went back to the front door and locked it, and then jogged upstairs to check on my family. They were fine, if a little scared. They didn't know about the smoke grenade yet, as most of it had already dissipated. I think I know how they're getting in, I told Rabia. I have an idea, and it's the only one that makes any sense. What are you talking about? she asked. No time to explain, I replied. Call the cops, I'll be right back. I didn't wait for a reply and bolted back down the stairs, only coming to a halt outside the door to the basement. I marveled at the fact that I could still run like that at this age. I shook my head and unlocked the door. I nudged it open, only to be greeted by foreboding darkness. Time to unlock the secrets of this place. I took a deep breath, turned on my phone's flashlight, and began climbing down the rickety wooden stairs. I skipped past an old study table, and moved to the center of the room before pulling on the string of the bolt. Warm light with a yellowish hue flooded the room, and I immediately began my investigation. I tossed the old junk around, dust-riddled tables, boxes full of kids' toys, stacks of ancient books, and so on, and kept on stomping on the floor kicking up small clouds of dust in the process. I didn't stop until I found it, just behind the tall cabinet with its door ripped off. As my shoe smashed into the ground, a sound echoed. The ground was hollow, and I knew why. I dropped down to my knees, swept my hands on the filthy floor until my fingers brushed against something astonishingly small and metallic. With trembling hands, I pulled the tiny latch of the trapdoor open and peered down into a small tunnel dug into the floor of my house. Rule number five. Any structural modifications to the house require the approval of the HOA. Part four. It looked like some oversized worm had burrowed into the floor of my basement, carving out a little tunnel to be used at its leisure. 
It wasn't too big or too small. There was just enough space for an average-sized man to squeeze through. I made a split-second decision, clutched my phone tight in my hands and dropped down into the hole. My feet landed instantly, such that the upper half of my body was still out in the basement. I crouched and crawled into the tunnel through the small fissure near the bottom. The hard ground dug into my elbows and knees as I propelled myself forward. It was cramped, and I could feel the weight of the earth pressing down on my back. The tight, narrow confines of the tunnel made old memories flash through my mind. I remembered hiding in bunkers, huddled together with my family, watching with trepidation as the world shook around us as planes flew overhead and dropped bombs that made dust angrily lash our heads and necks. I shook my head to clear my mind. Can't think about that or I'll pass out in fear, I thought. It was so overwhelmingly dark down there that even my phone's flashlight struggled to light up my way. I couldn't see the end of the tunnel. How long was this thing? Where did it lead to? Who built this? Why? I had so many questions bouncing around in my head that it made my neck hurt. I pushed all thoughts aside and focused on the task at hand. The more I pushed my way through, the more isolated from the world I felt. All it would take is one rumbling, one little yawn from the earth, and I'd be gone forever in a flash, buried under a mountain of debris. I could practically taste the mud in my mouth, feel it constricting my lungs. I had to stop every now and then to breathe. There were even times when I wanted to turn around, not that I could really, and just wait until the cops arrived. But there was something niggling at the back of my mind, telling me that I had to see this through myself. After what felt like an eternity, I came upon an opening in the tunnel. I slithered out of it like a snake and found that the passageway had become large enough for me to get on my hands and knees. Sighing in relief as oxygen rushed into my lungs, I began to look around. It seemed impossibly long and went both ways. I popped out somewhere in the middle of this larger tunnel. Once again I wondered who built this and for what purpose. I picked a direction and began crawling. All my confusion only deepened when I noticed other branches snaking off from the passageway, not dissimilar from the little hole I'd just crawled out of. Did they lead to other houses? What the fuck? There was a whole network of tunnels right beneath our feet. It must have taken a lot of time and planning to build this. But why? I knew I'd find the answers at the end of it all, so I kept on pushing through, after returning to place a handkerchief next to the hole that led back home. The end arrived rather suddenly, as it usually does in life, and I smacked into it head first. I gritted my teeth, rubbed my head, and waited for the pain to subside, before groping around above me for a trap door. Nothing but the immense weight of the earth. I turned around and went back the way I'd come from. I reasoned that both sides couldn't possibly lead to a dead end. Well, this bigger passage had to lead somewhere. And it did. At this end of the tunnel I found myself crouched down just beneath another trap door. The opening here was much larger, and I reasoned that this is where the dig must have begun. Well, here it goes, I thought. Just one little push and I'd have all my answers. As I prepared to uncover the mystery surrounding Seastone Ridge, I hoped and prayed that our nighttime intruders weren't waiting for me just out there, because that would be a joke of a way to die. I took a deep breath and nudged the trap door open, just a crack, and peered through the tiny slit. Well, it looked like another basement, but whose? I tried to check my surroundings as much as I reasonably could, and when I was reasonably sure that no one was there, I flung the trap door open and climbed out into the basement. The place was quite unlike ours. For one, it was clean. There was no clutter. And secondly, it was a wine cellar. Rows upon rows of floor-to-ceiling shelves stocked with delicately expensive liquor filled up the room. Where the fuck was I? Well, I didn't have to wait long to get an answer. I was debating with myself as to what my next step would be when I heard it. Keys jiggling as one is being slid into a lock. I slipped into a dark corner and waited. The door swung open. Light from the hallway beyond poured into the basement. Footsteps clicking on the stairs. 
I saw heels and then the hem of a red cocktail dress, and then the laughter. High-pitched, jovial. I recognised it. Didn't have to see her face to know who it was, to know whose house I was in. But I got the confirmation anyway as she came down and switched on the lights. I ducked and hid to avoid being seen as she started searching through the shelves, trying to pick out some suitable liquor for her small house party, allowing me the chance to get a good look at her face through the gap between two wine bottles. It was Amanda, the president of the Homeowners Association of Seastone Ridge. My heart hammered in my chest. What does this all mean, I thought. As president of the HOA, she's got to be aware that there's a tunnel underneath her house, right? Was she the one who's been tormenting us all this time? using her basement as a launching pad to send that asshole our way. But maybe not. Maybe it was someone else, and she's completely unaware of it. One of the other residents, or even a former resident, who built these tunnels to perv on his neighbours, and these modifications broke the rules and released some supernatural entity. But that was ridiculous. You can't pull something like this off without anyone else figuring it out right. Surely the others know, and if they do, why didn't they try to correct the damage by filling these tunnels up? That would have been my first response if I'd known that these tunnels really some subterranean monster. Besides, if that's really what happened, why aren't the other houses getting harassed with the same intensity that we are? There was only one obvious answer, and it all went back to Amanda. I didn't stick around for long. As soon as she left the cellar, down I went into the tunnel, crawling my way back to my house. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what was happening here. Was it really Amanda? Were the others involved? Why were they doing this? It seemed like the more I uncovered about the community, the more questions that popped up, like a messed up game of whack-a-mole. I was back in my house before the two cops arrived. They took the used-up smoke grenade as evidence and promised to try and track down where it had come from. They said that a patrol car had come by, but must have missed the intruders. I didn't tell them about the tunnel. I wanted to keep my cards close to my chest and think this thing through. There was no one in this neighbourhood that I fully trusted apart from my family. I saw the cops off, kissed my daughter goodnight, and talked to Rabia who didn't once ask me why I'd change out of my suddenly filthy clothes before the cops had arrived. That intruder is not going to come into this house again, I stated, fully feeling the confidence with which I'd said that. She raised her tired eyes at me, exhaustion and a tiny flicker of hope on her face. How? Are you sure? I kissed her on the forehead. It'll be over soon. Trust me. The next morning found me at my neighbour's doorstep. I'd thought long and hard about this, and had arrived at the conclusion that I needed to have one more conversation with the guy. It was a surprisingly windy day, and the American flag flew proudly from its pole as I knocked on David Easton's door. <sighs> it's you, he remarked blandly after opening the door. You're still here. Yes, I am, I replied, putting my hands on my waist. <sighs> what do you want? he asked gruffly. I was wondering if you had an axe or something. Why? Well, I'm thinking of cutting down the oak tree next to my house. Did you get permission on the HOA? Nope. Oh, you'll be forced to pay a hefty fine. The HOA doesn't... Fuck the HOA. He paused for a long second, and then his icy facade cracked into a most satisfied grin. <sighs> Wait just a second now. He shut the door on my face, and I tapped my foot as I waited for him to come back out. It didn't take long. I must have only waited a couple of minutes before he was out, a keychain dangling from his belt. An axe is not going to do it, you know, he said as he started walking towards his garage without explicitly asking me to follow him. We're not at the age where we can bring down a tree just by swinging our arms. <laughs> Speak for yourself, old man, I muttered. He laughed. <laughs> Thankfully... We have tools that can just help us get the job done without throwing a back set. He slid the key into the padlock and pulled the shutter of his garage up. I'm surprised Amanda hasn't asked you to bring your garage to the 21st century, I said. 
Oh, my house was here before the HOA was formed, he replied. She can't touch me. There it is, he said, pointing to the power saw placed on a shelf next to his pickup truck. This beauty will slice through that wood like it was butter. He yanked open a couple of drawers, looked through some more shelves and retrieved two safety goggles and some flat objects I'd never seen before. What's that? I asked. Tree felon wedges, he answered. Make sure that damn thing doesn't come crashing down on your house. I led him back to my house and we went around to the side until we reached the oak tree. You really want to bring the whole thing down? He asked as we stood in the shade of the tree. We could just cut down that branch over there. He pointed to the one that slithered its way up to the window upstairs. The one on which that intruder had been standing when he threw that smoke grenade in. I stared at him. How did you know I have a problem with that one? He shrugged. We stretched the power cord of the saw through a window and shoved it into a socket in the living room. I winked when Rabia shot me a questioning look, and she shook her head. Once I was back outside, David gestured at me to put on the safety goggles, and then revved up the saw before beginning the cutting process. It took a while, but we sliced that offending branch off, and it crashed into the ground. That fucker wasn't getting in that easily anymore. It'd make for some decent firewood, David remarked when we were taking a rest, surrounded by wood and sawdust littering the lawn. Yep, it would, I mumbled before raising my voice a little. You know, I met a lot of people here when we first moved in. They all said the same thing. Welcome to the community. Nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And then they warned me about the HOA's rules. Every single one of them, except you. He looked at me blankly. You were warning me, weren't you? I asked. I mean, honestly warning me. You knew what was wrong with this place and wanted us to get out, to save ourselves, right? He looked away before gently nodding. Ah, you seem like good, honest folk. Made no sense to let the darkness of this place infest your lives. Then why do you stay here? I continued. If you know what's happening here, whatever this is, well, why stay? Uh, too many fucking memories, he answered. Spent my whole life here. Raised a family. Lost a family. Oh, I'm too old to move out now. I paused and began picking at the log of wood next to me. I heard that you lost your son. He tensed up before his shoulders deflated with a long exhale. A century's worth of exhaustion in that one action. It was an IED blast. Didn't even get the chance to bury him properly. He paused. I'd spoken to him the night before. His leave had been approved. My boy, he, he was so excited about coming back home. And he did, just not the way I wanted him to. He sniffled. I lost my son too. I replied after a couple of heavy seconds. I still remember it like yesterday. He didn't want to go to school that day. He was faking a cold. I blinked, letting tears fall from my eyes. If I hadn't forced him to go that day. He started to tear up as well. I continued. I saw it happen. I was there to picking up from school. Heard the plane fly overhead. Felt the cloud of dust in my face. That smell of charred flesh, desperately sifting through the rubble. My voice began to crack. I found him, you know. He was so broken, my son, he... Couldn't finish my sentence and just broke down crying. David joined me in letting out his grief. There we were, two fathers who'd lost their sons to what was pretty much the same war, dealing with and wandering over our loss halfway round the world. My chest felt incredibly lighter after having talked with David, and I assumed it was the same for him. We cleared the lawn of the fallen wood and carried it back to his truck. He said he knew how to get rid of it, and I was just glad it wasn't littering my lawn anymore. You really should leave, you know, he remarked once we were back inside his garage. It's far too dangerous to stay here. Might be. I replied, but I can't run away. When we came to this country, my daughter made me promise that we wouldn't run away anymore. 
Whatever it is, we'll face it head on. His eyes hardened at that. Well then, you're going to need some help. He beckoned me to follow him as he led me to the back of his garage, to an iron safe fixed into the wall. He used his keys to open it, and pulled out a small pistol, a Beretta M9. You know how to use this? he asked. I nodded. Had to learn along the way. Good, he said as he pushed it into my hand before going back to the safe and getting me a small box of bullets. Are you sure? I asked. Yep, he replied. Do what you can to keep your family safe, your father. And maybe when this storm blows over, we can get together for a drink. I shook his hand, tucked the gun into the waistband of my jeans, and walked away before I wound up crying once again. The air was sizzling with tension as I walked back into my house. I could feel the gazes of the other neighbours like little daggers at the back of my neck, some with a mix of fear and curiosity, others with naked hatred in their eyes. Was that anger because we were still here, or because they'd noticed I'd cut down the tree, a gross violation of the HOA's rules? David was right. A storm was brewing in Seastone Ridge, one that would forever change the community. I spent the day with my family, assuring them it would all come to an end the following night. In the afternoon, I sat on my computer and got some work done before spending the evening with my family. My wife cooked up some delicious cussy for dinner, and the lamb was so delicious it made me forget about my worries while I was eating it. And it was Abida's favourite dish too. Rabia only worked as hard as she did to cook it to see her smile. Oh, there's nothing a parent wouldn't do for their child's happiness, is there? I know I'd do absolutely anything. And that's why after Rabia and Abida had gone to bed, I was sitting on a chair in the dark basement, off to the side of the trap door with a gun in my lap. That fucker was going to have a nasty surprise when he tried to sneak in this time. Half an hour before midnight, I was wide awake, tension turning my stomach in knots, body drenched in sweat, hands trembling with excitement. I heard it, shuffling movements just beneath the floor. The trapdoor moved. I pulled the gun up, took aim, a slight groan, a soft creak. The trap door opened. Part 5 The trap door swung open with a practiced ease, and a dark silhouette began to emerge. Even in the darkness of the basement, the white of the goat skull stood out bright enough to easily be spotted. The intruder began pulling himself up. Hey, I whispered. The man gasped, startled. He turned sharply. A flash of light, a loud bang. The body jerked over backwards as the wall behind him was painted red. I waited a second for the ringing in my ears to clear before getting up and trotting towards the body. I crinkled my nose at the stench of gunpowder and checked his pulse and confirmed that he was dead. Must have been one terrifying death. Imagine getting out of a tunnel into a basement to attack a family, day after day, having the full confidence of knowing you are going to be alone. And then suddenly, one day, you're not. It just so happens to be the very last day of your life. I had no sympathy for the man I'd just killed. I did what I had to do to protect my home and my family. Leaving the body alone for a moment, I got up and pulled on the string hanging from the ceiling allowing harsh yellow light to flood into the small basement. My actions felt far more real when taken out of the shadows and examined under the light. My heart raced and my legs wobbled as I realised I'd just killed a man, something I hadn't done in over a decade. I closed my eyes and counted to ten to calm myself down. When it felt like I was back in control, I crouched down over the oddly contorted body and began pulling the mask off. It was heavy and substance with which it had been made was hard, like it was made out of actual bone. I pulled it off and stumbled back when I saw who it was that I was looking at, who it was that had been invading my house, 
and who it was that I had just killed. It was Joseph Gardochki, the cop. I swore under my breath. This man had been showing up each night, promising to find the intruders when he himself was the one tormenting us. But why, though? I searched the corpse, patted his pockets and retrieved his ID, his wallet, a phone and some lockpicks. As I continued searching, his shirt bunched up and I noticed some tattoos on his belly. With clammy hands that were shaking wildly, I pulled his shirt up to get a closer look at these tattoos. My heart sank. His entire torso was tatted up. Swastikas, iron crosses, imperial German flags, hateful phrases like Blut und Er, Weismarkt. His body was a canvas for neo-Nazi imagery. Of course they wanted us out. They hated us for who we were. It was a miracle they hadn't tried to kill us yet. Wait a second, I thought. If this guy was here, then that means his partner was involved as well. Of a king course. There were two of them. They must have been working together to give the false impression that there was only one supernatural monstrosity. It was probably Amanda who told Schmidt to repeatedly warn Rabia about the rules, to try and reinforce the idea that there was some otherworldly evil entity prancing around in the neighborhood. Oh, those bastards. The terrible screech pierced the silence that had enveloped the basement. Oh, fuck you. It was Schmidt. He was in the house. I whirled around and began running up the stairs. Flinging the basement door open, I darted to my right, slipped past the furniture of the living room and arrived at the foot of the stairs that led up to the first floor. Another scream, followed by loud banging, like a hammer pounding a slab of wood. I sprinted up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my chest burning from the lack of oxygen. I arrived at the landing, turned and looked down the hallway. There he was, swinging away at the master bedroom door with an axe. By Allah's grace, the wood was strong and was still holding on, though some wide cracks had started to show. I took a deep breath to steady myself as Officer Schmidt continued bringing his axe down on the door. I couldn't rush this. My family was just beyond that door, and I couldn't with a hundred percent certainty assume that they weren't in the line of fire. I couldn't miss. I had to get the bastard with this one shot. I brought the gun up, exhaled, waited for my hand to stop shaking, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet hit him in the back of his neck and he folded, slumping against the door with a sickening crunch. I tucked the gun in my belt, strode over to the body and pulled it off the door. Popping his mask off, I confirmed that it was Officer Schmidt's body, before getting up and knocking on the door. Rabia, I said, my voice shaky from the adrenaline. Open the door, it's me. I heard footsteps, and then the door was thrown open. My wife and daughter jumped into my arms, and I comforted them. It's over now. It's over for good. Sidestepping the corpse of Officer Schmidt... I brought my family to Abida's room and gave them a quick rundown on what had happened. Abida looked horrified at the scale of it all, while Rabia seemed angry that I didn't tell her about the tunnel, or the gun that David had lent me. I was going to be in a lot of trouble for the lies and the secrets, but well, I was fine with that. I had my reasons for going about things the way I did. They both gawped at me in shock when I told them that the HOA was behind all this, and that the two men I'd just killed were the cops who'd been coming to our house under the pretext of helping us, when they were, in fact, the reason why we called 911 in the first place. I wasn't finished talking when the bedroom windows in the room were lit up with flashes of red and blue. Looks like the police are here, Rabia stated, relieved. It's finally over. But my eyes widened in alarm. What's wrong, Yevon? she asked. I put my finger on my lips and told her to be quiet. I tiptoed over to the window, the one that opened up to the lawn, and not the one that was smashed last night. Pulled aside the curtains and peered outside. There were two cop cars and dozens of people, our neighbours, out on my lawn. How did the police get there so quickly? We didn't call them. And that means it must have been one of the neighbours. 
and the fact that they hadn't done so in the last couple of days, but chose to do so now, made anxiety worm its way into my belly. Were there other members of the local law enforcement who were involved in this shit? Well, my suspicions were confirmed when I saw Amanda chatting with the cops. They're not here to help us, I whispered. What? Rabia asked. They've come to finish the job. I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket, and it nearly gave me a heart attack. I breathed out in relief when I saw who was calling. Hello, I said, answering the call. Don't let them in. David's voice crackled into my ears. They're Nazis, I said. I know. Yeah, yeah, they are. I heard gunshots. Did you? Yes. He paused. You need to get out of there. They won't let us, I pointed out. Oh, you have no choice now, he said, cutting the call. I deliberated on our options. Should we do as David says and try and escape? Or try and reason with them? Well, there's no way we can talk. Not after I killed two of them. Try and fight and wait for some good police to come out. But would they? How many cops are in on this? And could we last until then? Well, I had just the one gun. Who knew what they were packing? Mr. Abbas, a loud voice boomed, cutting off my chain of thought. I crawled to the window and peeked outside. One of the cops was speaking into an electric megaphone. We received a complaint about gunshots from your house. If everything is... Amanda snatched the mic away from him. You killed them, didn't you? She shrieked. You'll pay for this, you mother, or I'm going to slaughter you all. There won't be enough pieces of you left to bury, you goat-fucking piece of shit. She threw the mic back at the cop and screamed at him. He looked offended, but nodded his head. He signaled at the other cops, and they began moving towards the house. I panicked, took the gun out and pushed the window open and fired at the invaders, emptying the clip in one go. I was terrified, but my aim wasn't that bad. They were running in the open, and I got two of them, one in the eyeball and the other in the neck. Blood sprayed out of their wounds like punctured water blooms, and they both crashed onto the ground ungracefully. My wife and daughter let out muffled screams of fear. The remaining cops retreated, finding cover behind their cars as the other neighbors scattered away like ants from a flooded nest. Some would return, however, lugging rifles and pistols of different makes. Together, the cops and residents of Seastone Ridge began their assault on our home, trying to turn the walls of our house into Swiss cheese. I fell down and hugged the floor, instructing my family to do the same. The world exploded around us in a hail of deafening gunfire. Shattered glass, bits of concrete, splintered wood rained down on us as bullets mercilessly punched into the house. I crawled out of the bedroom and motioned to my wife to follow me. I spotted Abida shivering on the floor, her ears covered, eyes squeezed shut. I grabbed her leg and shook it. She kicked and pulled her leg away. We have to go, I screamed, trying to make myself heard over the gunshots. No. I shook her leg again, finally getting her attention. Her eyes were wide and her whole body was trembling. Oh, damn it, not now. It would be beyond terrible if she were to have a panic attack with all this going on. We have to go, I mouthed at her, and she nodded. Good. I told Abida to stick close to me, and we began moving downstairs. Oh, she was still shaking so badly, it both scared and angered me. Those Nazi bastards. As we crawled down like worms, bullets punched through the wall, allowing moonlight to filter in lighting up the staircase in the process. It was terrifying. One stroke of bad luck, one misstep, and we were dead. But luck was on our side that night, not theirs, and we made it to the bottom safely. Surprisingly enough, as we reached the living room, we noticed that bullets were no longer entering the house, though the gunfire continued unabated. I didn't figure out until later what had happened. The pause in bullets whizzing past us gave me a bit of confidence, I got up on my hands and knees and sped up as I made my way to the kitchen. Abida and Rabia followed suit, 
Reaching the door that opened to the garage, I got up and shoved it open. Get in, I yelled, opening the car doors, the gunfire sounding even louder in the garage. Down there. I pushed them onto the floor of the car, in the space between the front and the back seats. After making sure they were safely tucked in, I leapt into the driver's seat. I revved the car up before clicking the button to slide the automatic garage door open, thanking the stars that it wasn't like the door David had in his garage. Muzzle flashes brightened my vision as the door went up, revealing the outside to me. I noticed many bodies sprawled on the ground, far more than I'd last seen. What had happened here? I got my answer when I pressed my foot on the gas, zoomed out of the garage and entered the street. The cops and the HOA were no longer firing at our house, because they were busy shooting at David's place, who'd surprised them and laid waste to about half their numbers. As the car skidded on the asphalt and made a sharp turn, out of the corner of my eye I even spotted Amanda, lifelessly slumped against a cop car. Seemed like David had another gun hidden away somewhere. Stay safe, my friend, I thought as I tore through the neighborhood, leaving the grotesque war behind in the rear-view mirror. Oh, they peppered us with bullets, blowing out the rear windshield, but we safely made it to the front gate of Seastone Ridge only to find it locked. The staccato gunfire had trailed off to the odd shot here and there. I climbed out of the car and tried to pry the gate open, when a bullet sparked against it inches from my hand. I ducked and hid behind the car. Bracing against the hood, I pushed my legs against the gate after pulling the latch open. Another bullet smashed into the side of the car. I swore and took my gun out of the glove box. It was empty. Fuck. I slid the magazine out and began shoving some bullets into it. The security guard of the community jumped out from behind a wall and began jogging towards us, a rifle in hand. Oh, damn. Not now. Not like this. Not when we were so close. Baba, Abida said, her head rising. My eyes widened. The guard got close to the car, brought his gun up, he had her in his sight. But I was quicker, and my aim was perfect. I opened up a hole in the middle of his forehead, jumped back into the car, and drove out of the neighborhood. That night our neighborhood was witness to unbelievable carnage. Over a dozen corpses littered the streets, and property worth millions was destroyed. But that wasn't the worst of it. No. David, that clever bastard baited some of them into coming down into the underground tunnel and set off a minor explosion, burying them alive. And that marked the end of that assault. The events of that night had far-reaching consequences for our small town. The local police department was utterly destroyed as many of its personnel, including some senior officers, were exposed for having links to local neo-Nazi gangs. Some were arrested, some were fired, others got away with plausible deniability, but they never bothered anyone again. Over half the neighborhood was put behind bars, at least those who survived. We finally found out what Amanda and her coterie wanted. Their plan was to establish a semi-autonomous white nation-state that had very limited contact with the outside world and allowed no minorities. Oh, they screwed up by not buying off the realtor, I guess. One little mistake and Amanda ended up with a hole in her face, courtesy of one David Easton. Oh, he uh, survived, by the way. Tough bastard escaped out the back door while they were invading his house. He was upset about having to do all that repair work, but, but civil lawsuits ensured he didn't have to spend much out of his own pockets. We moved back into Seastone Ridge. The money we got from the lawsuits was enough to put Abida through college and rebuild the house from the ground up. Rabia, bless her soul, stayed with me, despite my utterly reckless behavior. We got counseling, and have come out as a stronger couple. And things are different in Seastone Ridge now. The HOA has been disbanded. A Korean family has moved into Amanda's house. There's genuine happiness in the air now. It feels like a real neighborhood, with barbecues and all. And sometimes on the weekends... David and I sit out on his deck, drink beer, and talk about our children. Oh, 
Well, a pure work of fiction, of course, and not related to real life in any way, shape, or form. Um, excellent story, I thought. Brilliant. One of the best I've read in quite some time. Fantastically well-paced and kept you totally gripped throughout. Loved that one. All right, well, um, onwards and upwards. Back again on Sunday. Um, one of the serials I've been meaning to finish off for a while. Not quite sure which one yet, but Serial Sunday is back. Definitely. Until then, my dear friends, you'll have a safe and lovely weekend. And very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.